Um, hello, everyone. So we have Professor Keith Wendelinde with us to talk about radio astronomy. Um, Professor Keith is an experimental cosmologist and a long wavelength instrumentalist. Currently, he's employed um, at the Dunlap Institute of Depa uh, and Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Toronto. His primary research is uh, his primary research interests involve large scale structures in the universe. So without any further ado, let's start the talk. All right, thanks very much. Uh, and thanks for having me. Uh, I guess I'm here to tell you about uh, the new era of radio astronomy as I titled it. And the thing that I wanna talk about today uh, is really that if you look at the screen here, this picture that I have up, this is a modern radio telescope. Uh, one that was recently built in Canada called Chime, which is making great discovery across a wide range of uh, astronomy. And if you look at it, it looks nothing like a typical telescope. And that's sort of what I want to get into, uh, why it is that new radio telescopes are just drastically different from what you think of when you think of radio telescopes or optical telescopes or really any kind of telescope. Uh, before that, though, I, I, I know very few people have had exposure to radio astronomy of any sort. Uh, so I'm going to spend sort of the first half of the talk maybe laying the groundwork and explaining how radio astronomy fits in with everything else. Uh, and then we'll get into what it is that's changed in the world that means we've entered this, this new era. So starting at the start, um, hopefully everyone here is familiar with light. Uh, this is the rainbow that we're all taught about, Roy G. Biv, the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, uh, that covers the optical spectrum. But as you've probably come across before, there are many, many more colors of light than that. These are just the colors of light that human eyes are sensitive to. And this is really just a tiny fraction of a much, much broader spectrum of uh, electromagnetic radiation of light, which ranges from gamma rays at the high energy end down through X-rays, which still have enough energy to you know, go through us and produce images of our insides. Uh, ultraviolet light, which the sun emits tons of and that we try to stay away from because it can ionize our cells and our DNA uh, through the visible range into infrared waves. Uh, which we glow in infrared. We, we personally emit infrared waves uh, down to microwaves and at the lowest energy end, radio waves. So this is the, the end that we're talking about when talking about radio astronomy. But really, these are all the same basic phenomenon. Uh, if you look at the sky, if you're lucky enough to live somewhere uh, dark, it looks something like this visibly. Uh, this is where I've I guess I should say I've taken the sky, the sphere of the sky around the Earth, and just unwrapped it to draw it flat. So this is like taking a globe and flattening it out into some sort of uh, projection. So if you look at the visible sky, it looks something like this, where I've drawn the galaxy through the middle here. So this is the Milky Way. You can see lots of starlight everywhere. You can see the large and small Magellanic clouds, dwarf galaxies orbiting the Milky Way. You can see these dust lanes. This is uh, interstellar dust that's blocking starlight from getting to us. It makes it slightly harder to see our galaxy. Um, if we walk through this spectrum, though, we can see different things at different frequencies, at different colors of light. So at the highest end, uh, the highest energy end, this is what the gamma ray sky looks like. Uh, again, mostly our galaxy, but a lot of these little point sources that are mostly active galactic nuclei, uh, stuff orbiting rapidly around and falling into supermassive black holes, uh, and along the way getting so incredibly hot that it emits these super high energy gamma rays. Um, in x-rays, it's hard to take a picture of the sky, uh, mostly because uh, you need an x-ray satellite. The, the atmosphere is opaque to x-rays, and it, there haven't been really great all sky images of the x-ray sky. This is what it looks like. Again, you can see the Milky Way through. Most of the light that you see here is coming from uh, supernova remnants, so stars that have exploded and are still shining in X-ray. Uh, ultraviolet's even worse. It's almost impossible to get a decent ultraviolet picture of the sky because the sun emits so much ultraviolet light. Uh, the, the sky is just flooded with the stuff, so trying to see anything other than the sun is almost impossible. But then you have to go to space. The atmosphere blocks ultraviolet light. It's opaque to it. Uh, which is a good thing, right? That's, that's why we can go outside and not immediately get sunburns, uh, but it doesn't block it perfectly. Uh, to make an image like this, you really have to go into uh, space. So the GALAX is uh, a UV imaging satellite. Uh, the 
visible light sky I already showed. Again, Milky Way through the middle, large and small Magellanic clouds, dust lanes through it. And at lower energy, the infrared sky. Uh, infrared is where a lot of uh, telescopes are going now. We've switched from just using optical telescopes to using what are called OIR telescopes, optical infrared, uh, because starlight is typically much easier to see in infrared, um, mostly because these dust lanes aren't nearly as obscuring. They don't do as good a job of blocking. So if you want to look at stars, infrared is the way to go. If you want to look at exoplanets, infrared is also typically the best way to see them. You get the highest contrast of the planet against the star that it's right next to uh, in infrared. Um, like I mentioned quickly, though, all of these are fundamentally the same physical thing. Light of any of these uh, ranges is just an electromagnetic wave. So it's an oscillating electric field going up and down and up and down and up and down incredibly fast. Uh, and a magnetic field oscillating the other way, uh, also incredibly quickly. Um, all of these are the same thing. The different colors of light just talk about how fast that's oscillating. So gamma rays have the, the shortest wavelength, the fastest oscillation. Uh, infrared of the ones we've seen are the slowest oscillation, the longest wavelength. And if you compare the whole spectrum, so this is now flipped from earlier, gamma rays have wavelengths sort of the size of an atomic nucleus. Uh, radio waves are kilometers long. Uh, the, the, the length between adjacent peaks in the electric field. Now, you'll notice that I haven't gone through the, the microwave and radio, the low energy end of that spectrum. And there's a reason, which is that no one really did for a long time. Most of the light that we see is in the form of black body radiation. So this is thermal radiation from starlight. Uh, when you look at the visible sky or the infrared sky, that's typically what you're looking at. And this is what black body spectra look like. Here I've plotted the frequency, so high energy light on the right, low energy light on the left. And the, this is uh, essentially the power that it's emitting. And this is for different temperatures, 300 Kelvin, so roughly room temperature, 1,000 Kelvin, 3,000 Kelvin. The sun is 5,700 Kelvin, roughly. So it's somewhere between this 3 and 10 line. Uh, and so on. Uh, bigger and bigger stars that run you know, bluer, they are hotter stars, and they produce more higher energy light. Blue is a higher energy light than red. And if you look at this, you'll see that out at this low end, there's just not that much energy. Uh, most of the energy is out at these higher frequencies. So most of the, the energy that comes from thermal radiation, from starlight, is in infrared, optical, UV, uh, and then for the biggest stars into sort of X-rays and gamma rays, if you get to absurd sort of energy levels. But there's not much energy down in the microwave or radio regime. So for a long time, no one really bothered to look. It was also a technology limitation that looking at these low energy lights requires different kinds of detectors. You can't see them with the naked eye. Uh, and the early detectors that we built for seeing the sky, uh, photographic plates and the like, also don't work particularly well with microwave or radio light, which is kind of a shame because when people did finally look at microwave and radio, they saw really neat stuff. Uh, this is a picture of the microwave sky. And you'll notice it looks different from the other ones. Uh, this is not an error. It is a solid gray glow from everywhere on the sky. And this image was made in 1965 and won a Nobel Prize <laughs> because this is the cosmic microwave background. Uh, it's a background thermal light that is coming from farther away than any other light in the universe. It's from the earliest moments of the universe's history at the end of the first few hundred thousand years of the universe's existence. Uh, this was in, released. This light is the leftover from the Big Bang. It's, it's a remnant glow of the early plasma universe. Uh, and it's something that lots of people spend ages studying. This is how I got into the field, studying this cosmic microwave background. Uh, radio waves are a little more detailed than that. I should say that that's what the microwave sky looks like. If you increase the contrast massively, there are a lot of features to study. It's not just looking at a gray background all the time, but uh, the gray background alone is Nobel worthy. So this is what the radio sky looks like. And you may notice here, it's slightly different from the others. You still see a galaxy through the middle, uh, just like everything else. And you see a couple of point sources, but it's not really starlight everywhere. What you're looking at here is not thermal emission. It, the, the radio sky is interesting. It's full of light, but it's not full of starlight. 
the same way that, say, the infrared sky or the visible sky. Um, nowadays, people do look at these. And it's in part because, well, we can. Uh, this is a plot of how opaque the atmosphere is as a function of wavelength. Uh, so shown here in the rainbow is the visible range. Again, high energy is on the left, low energy on the right. And what this is saying is that the atmosphere is completely opaque to gamma rays, x-rays, UV, and only at the tail of ultraviolet does it light start to get through the atmosphere to the ground. And then there's this big hole in the atmosphere that lets in, uh, hole metaphorically, uh, that lets in visible light. So we can see visible light largely because the atmosphere lets it through. And then in infrared, there are chunks that are blocked, chunks that are let through. It's sort of messy. But when you get down to microwave and radio, it becomes clear, much clearer than anywhere else. So a huge region uh, from sort of a millimeter wavelength to 10 meters of wavelength, which corresponds to 30 million cycles up and down per second to 300 billion cycles up and down per second, uh, the atmosphere is almost completely transparent. Everything OK? I hear a bit of background noise. OK. <laughs> um, so it turns out that if you were to look at microwave or radio light, you can basically ignore the presence of the atmosphere. It almost doesn't matter for you. Now, there are cases where that's not quite true, but in large part, that is the case. So all of this actually kicked off. The first, micro, the first radio astronomy kicked off with a guy called Carl Jansky in the 30s. Uh, this is what his telescope looked like. He was not a radio astronomer. Uh, that didn't exist at the time. There was no such thing as radio astronomy. Uh, he was a radio engineer. He worked with Bell Labs, uh, and he was working on wireless communications. And they had assigned him the task of figuring out where a few sources of anomalous noise were coming from. There was fuzz on their wireless communications, just a background buzz, and they weren't sure where it was coming from. So he was assigned to look into this. He built this uh, telescope out of a reconditioned, heavily reconditioned Model T Ford. You can still see the wheels. Uh, and this could rotate. You can see it sort of on a circular base here. He could turn this thing around and use it to listen to radio waves. Uh, it's sensitive to very low frequencies, 20 megahertz. Um, but this is the device that he used to try and figure out where this noise was coming from. He found a few sources. One was uh, distant lightning storms. Uh, if you have lightning off in the distance, that produces uh, radio interference, just sort of fuzz in the background. But one he was really confused about. He took his antenna and he turned it around and turned it around. And the stuff was always coming from the same source, the same direction. Each time he turned it around. Here he's rotating it southeast, northwest, southeast, northwest, spinning his device around and letting time pass. And he discovered that uh, not only was there this source that seemed to be from the same spot, but actually it wasn't quite the same spot. That spot moved around on the sky as the day passed. And it didn't even take quite 24 hours. Uh, it wasn't quite daily. It was 23 hours and 56 minutes. It would rotate around and come back to the same spot. And he did not know what this was, but after a consultation with people, he discovered that's the length of a sidereal day, which means this is some astronomical signal. So in the 30s, there was this massive uh, hubbub. Uh, this was from the front page of the New York Times, new radio waves traced to the center of the Milky Way. This was a, an astonishing discovery that there were radio waves coming from space. Uh, until then, remember, people had only used radio waves for communications. So they were fairly surprised by this. Uh, You'll note the line at the end that says, no evidence of interstellar signaling, because that's immediately where their minds went. They, they thought, there are radio waves coming from space. Someone might be trying to talk to us. Um, so Jansky was a, an engineer at Bell Labs in the 1930s, and he actually proposed to build a parabolic dish to try and study this, a big parabolic mirror uh, 30 meters across to study this radiation to make sense of it. Uh, and Bell Labs did not like that idea. They didn't want to sink money into radio astronomy. They told him no, changed his assignment, and he was never allowed to do astronomy again. Uh, unfortunately, that was the end of his career. He invented radio astronomy and then was not allowed to do it anymore. Um, this is His telescope still exists. Uh, it's on display in Green Bank in West Virginia. Uh, and the unit of luminous flux uh, is named after him, one Jansky. Uh, this is a unit that's used throughout astronomy now 
uh, in his honor to describe how much power is coming in per spectral band per unit area. So this is the sort of thing that we use to remember him, but he never got past those first steps. And it might have died there if it weren't for a guy called Grota Raber, who in the 30s was living outside Chicago. He was an amateur astronomer and a professional radio repairman. Uh, he conveniently had just the right skills. And he read about this discovery and thought, that's amazing. I would, I, I bet I could measure radio waves from space because I build radio receivers and I like space. So he went into his mother's backyard and he built the world's first radio telescope in his spare time on weekends and evenings. Uh, he took years operating this. He invented the whole thing from scratch. Remember, there had never been a radio telescope before. This is the first time it's ever been invented. Uh, he tried to measure at 3,300 megacycles per second for a year, tried to map out the sky, and decided at the end of that that he had no signal. So he tried again the next year at a lower frequency, a longer wavelength, and decided that he had no signal. But he was luckily, he stuck with it and tried a, a third time at 150 megahertz. And lo and behold, he discovered the galaxy. He mapped out, he made the first radio images of the sky. And from then, for the next several decades, he was the world's one and only and leading radio astronomer. Uh, his telescope also is preserved in Green Bank, still exists, you can go see it. It's an astonishing thing for uh, a teenage kid to have made in his backyard or his mom's backyard. Uh, and it really, you know, everyone is still in the field fairly amazed by this guy that he was able to do this and stick with it long enough to invent the field. Um, it, it did take him a while to convince actual astronomers that what he was doing wasn't just a hoax. Uh, he had to invite people out to, uh, from Yerkes Observatory to visit his telescope to convince them before he could get any papers published. Um, this basic design, though, actually stuck for a long time. Uh, this is what most people think of when they see radio telescopes, uh, or when they, when they hear radio telescopes, some sort of parabolic mirror with these arms holding up a detector at the focus. And over time, these got bigger and bigger and bigger. In the sort of golden age of radio astronomy in the 60s and 70s, uh, they got enormous. This is the Green Bank 300-foot dish. Uh, this is 300 feet across, almost 100 meters. And you can see cars at the bottom for scale, right? This is an enormous structure, basically modeled after this, this kid's backyard project, which, again, is a, a huge achievement. Uh, and the reason that they became this big, there are two reasons that, that we make larger and larger telescopes. One is just to make a larger light bucket. So this captures more radio waves because it's physically larger. There is more area to collect waves coming in from space, makes it more sensitive. The other is for resolution. Um, resolution uh, is a, a tricky thing to get. To get a high resolution, you know, fine angular scale, detailed image of something, you need some, well, it, your ability to resolve things depends on the size of your telescope or your imaging optics generally. So for example, a human eye has a pupil that's a couple of millimeters across. That gives a resolution of something like an arc minute, 1 60th of a degree. Uh, an eagle has a pupil that's about three times bigger than a human eye, and their resolution is about three times better. That's why eagles can see things much farther away than people can, because they have much finer resolution. The Hubble Space Telescope, uh, has a pupil of about 2.4 meters across, which means that its resolution is about a thousand times better than a human. Uh, this is why Hubble gets these amazing images, partly because it has a large collecting area. So it gets a lot of photons. It's got a big light bucket. But a lot of it is just the, the really fine resolution that you can get out of it. The complication, though, is that it doesn't just depend on the size. It also depends on the color of light that you're looking at. Uh, the, the smaller the wavelength of light, uh, the higher resolution you have. Because really what matters is how big your collecting area is in units of wavelengths. Uh, and remember, these radio waves are enormous. So if I look at a microwave telescope, the South Pole Telescope, uh, it's an eight meter wide telescope, and it's got the same resolution as my eye with a one to two millimeter pupil. Uh, so looking at microwaves, it, it, it takes a giant structure to get something with the resolution of a human. If you look at uh, the second 
Green Bank Telescope, this 100 meter dish, uh, it's something like 4 million times larger waves. It's got 100 meter pupil and it's still 20 times worse than my eye. So you can build this enormous superstructure, which is 100 meters wide, and it's got 20 times worse resolution than my eye does. That's a difficult thing to overcome. And that, that is really something that has limited radio astronomy for a long time, that it's just hard to build something with high resolution. And even if you do build these giant ones, that's version two because version one collapsed because large superstructures like this that are built lightweight uh, aren't necessarily robust against storms. Uh, and actually it was not even the storm that did this in. They were trying to park it to make it safe after a storm and something went wrong with one of the gears on one side and it sheared itself apart. Uh, the gears on two sides And then all this case. Um, so building these giant telescopes, there, there's sort of a limit to how far you can go. We, we would have a hard time building something with the resolution of Hubble at radio wavelengths. So if we take a step back and ask what can be done about that, um, if you look at a traditional telescope, this is what a lens telescope, a refracting telescope looks like and how it works. Light comes in straight, the lens bends the light so that it all converges at some focal point and adds up constructively here. Uh, anywhere else, it's destructively interfered away. If you're thinking about this uh, in a full electromagnetic treatment, if you want ray tracing, it just it changes the direction that they come in so that they all converge at one point. And then you put a detector here, and the point that they converge at depends on the angle that the light's coming in at, which means your detector sees light at different points corresponding to different angles. It makes an image. Uh, the same basic thing works with a traditional reflecting telescope, uh, where instead of a lens, you use a mirror to bend light rays down and focus them onto some sort of detector. Um, now, that works great for optical. But for radio, uh, like I said, building these enormous mirrors gets really expensive. There's another option, though, uh, which is instead of using the mirror to focus light, you can just cover it with detectors. And then you can add little delays to mimic the extra distance that light has to travel. If it would have had to travel to get to the focus. So I detect the light at each one of these X's now, and then I just add them all up. And it's actually exactly the same mathematically as if I had built this system, which is great because then I can throw out the dish. Uh, I can just throw detectors on the ground uh, and add up the signals that I make, or the signals that I record. And that's equivalent to having this giant dish, this 100 meter wide dish that I'm afraid of falling apart. I can replace with a bunch of detectors on the ground. Uh, this is what's called an adding correlator. So it, we gather the radio waves striking different regions on the ground, and we add them together. And this is actually something that people have known for a long time. Uh, all the way back in the war, uh, where a lot of radio astronomy uh, early developments come from. Uh, radar arrays did this. If you've seen images like this of all of these antennas lined up or antennas on the nose of a plane or these enormous antenna arrays that were like uh, on the east coast of Canada, um, these are multiple detectors where they're just adding them up. And it makes the equivalent of sticking a great big dish on the nose of this plane without having to worry about having a giant dish catching all the wind. This is what's called a phased array radar, where you just take all of these individual detectors and you add them up. Your sensitivity goes up as if you had a dish this big, but you didn't have to buy a dish, which fantastic. Dishes are large, complicated, made of a lot of steel, and steel is expensive. Um, even better, you can do better. You don't just have to add them up in phase so that you're seeing straight ahead. You can add extra delays. If I add lots of delay to the first one, a little less to the next, a little less to the next, a little less to the next, and so on, that has the effect of steering where I'm sensitive to. So you can point these things, even though they're sitting on the ground and you can't physically move them, you can electrically or adjust cables on them to make them point somewhere else. And this is something that phased array people have been doing for a long time. Uh, so if you have one of these phased array radars on the nose of a plane, if you just add them up, it points straight. If you, add, if you delay them 
so this one emits first, then this one, 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 then that wave travels out in a different direction. This is a, a what's called a phased array radar, and you can point these, and you can do it really fast. You've probably seen on uh, aircraft carriers or you know, pictures of military boats, these uh, dishes that spin around, which have radar on them. Uh, that is not how people do it anymore. We don't bother physically spinning things because we can do it digitally. This is what a modern radar looks like. And this scans back and forth across the sky thousands of times a second, just by changing the delays on each of these signals. Uh, so this is sort of what a modern telescope looks like because it's not just one telescope. You can, you can use this to point in lots of different directions. And this is a, a US military phase array radar located in the far north. Uh, this is a technology that's, that's well known and again, has been growing since the Second World War. Uh, and this is something that ra radio astronomers sort of took on board and started taking over in the 2000s. So starting about 20 years ago, people built things like the low frequency array and the long wavelength array, which they mean the same thing. Low frequency is equivalent to long wavelength in light, but LOFAR is the European version. This is scattered across Europe. Uh, and the LWA is the American version. These are scattered across the US. And the idea is basically that they just put down a bunch of these simple, simple, simple detectors in a field, and then you add them up with some sort of delay. So they add delays through them. Uh, this might seem silly, but um, the delays don't have to be done with physical cables. So originally the way people would do this is with literally, you attach a cable that's one foot long to one of them, that's nine inches long to the next, six inches to the next, three inches to the next, and then the fourth one you don't extend. Uh, nowadays, what we do is we digitize these. We record the electromagnetic signal, the electromagnetic wave coming into each of them, and we digitally delay them by a nanosecond, two nanoseconds, three nanoseconds, whatever the amount is that we care about, because computers are cheap. Uh, and because computers are cheap, once we've recorded all of these, and then we delay them and then add them up, we form a beam going this way. And then we attach a second computer, which we ask to delay them in a slightly different way and add them up, and that makes it look there. And then we attach a third computer, which looks there, and a fourth that looks there. And each one of these, all of these are generated from the same data at the same time, and each one acts as an independent telescope looking in an independent direction. So now instead of having this giant steel dish that costs a fortune to build, which I have to swing around and I'm afraid of it breaking, I just lie these on the ground, and it's as if I had thousands of these huge dishes all looking in different directions. Uh, this is the thing that's really changing radio astronomy. Doing this uh, has the potential to just alter the way we look at the sky, right? We don't have to build hundreds of these 100 meter dishes. We can build hundreds of little detectors. And the best part of it is that the real cost here then is in the electronics, in this back end part. Previously, all the cost was in steel. Steel has been pretty stable in price. If anything, it goes up in price year to year. Electronics are not stable in price. They drop drastically. If you can't afford your telescope today, wait 18 months and it'll cost half as much. If you can't afford it then, wait another year and a half and it'll be a quarter what it originally was. If you can't do it then, wait another year and a half and so on. So within you know, a fairly small amount of time, you can afford to do almost anything. Uh, because of this sort of digital revolution that we're living in. Uh, there are a couple of downsides to this option. If you want to try and cover a 100 meter dish area with detectors, so all across the ground over 100 meters, that's a lot of detectors. Uh, sure, you can buy a bigger computer for it, but you still need the detectors in front of the computer. Uh, and every detector needs to be made up of a number of things, some sort of feed that, that absorbs the radio waves from the sky, some sort of amplifier to make them bright enough to see without adding so much noise that you can't see. You need filters to choose what color of radio light you're looking at. And you need high-speed digitizers that can actually sample the waves hundreds of millions of times per second. Uh, and historically, that's meant tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars per detector. They were these high-tech devices which had to be kept cryogenically cold, so minus 200 degrees, so that their amplifiers were quiet enough. Uh, the digitizers were sort of one-off custom jobs that cost a fortune. 
And that sort of pushed people away from building these large aperture arrays. Uh, the reason both of these beamforming arrays are at low frequency and long wavelength, that means sort of 100 megahertz, 100 million samples per second, is because things are cheaper there. It's cheaper to get a digitizer that can run at these frequencies. It's cheaper to get a low noise amplifier, which works at these frequencies. Um, and it's only recently that we've got around some of those limitations. But because of that, if people wanted to cover a bigger area and they couldn't afford to completely cover the area, they started to use arrays of radio telescopes. So you've probably seen pictures like this. This is the VLA located in New Mexico in the US. These are, I think, 26 meter dishes. Uh, and there are 27 of them in a, a triangular pattern. Um, recently, it was upgraded and became the Jansky Very Large Array. So again, something named after Jansky. But this is uh, the, the way that you would get things far apart to give you that fine angular resolution without having thousands and thousands and thousands of detectors. You'll note that there's uh, a a railroad track behind them, that's because these can actually move. All of them can pick up, drive back onto this, and drive away. And at the, the largest distance, they can be tens of kilometers apart. And the reason for that uh, is to get these high resolution images. And to understand how that works, uh, I, I just want to run, run through a quick version of how, how we decide, how we see things in high resolution. So if there's a source off in the distance and it's emitting radio waves, this is you know, some star in a distant galaxy or a distant galaxy or some other, you know, a pulsar or something like that, those come in as waves, radio waves. So this is you know, maximum electric field, minimum, maximum, minimum, maximum, minimum, and so on. It's this oscillating electromagnetic wave. And that wave comes in from the source and it hits the telescope on the right before it hits the telescope on the left, right? So there is a time delay between when it arrives this one on the right, and when it arrives at the one on the left. And that time delay depends on where that source is. If the source is a little bit to the left, that time delay gets slightly shorter. If the source is directly overhead, it's equal. So in radio, if you build one of these arrays, what you're trying to do is measure the delay between when signals arrive at one of these telescopes and another. Uh, and that delay tells you where that light's coming from. And you can measure how much light is coming from what delay, which is to say, how much light is coming from what point on the sky, which is to say, making an image, right? That's what an image is, how bright things are at different points in the sky. And you can do it as a function of frequency, so as a function of color, uh, and make a colored image, uh, which is just how much light you're getting from different points in the sky. Now, mathematically, that's pretty ugly. I'm just going to flash this up so that you have a sense for it. Uh, but we understand the math. This is what actually goes into it. We correlate these two signals. We write down what the electric fields are. We take the conjugate of one and multiply them, time average them, and we run into this whole giant mess. And you end up with this funny rule that the thing you measure is Fourier conjugate to the intensity pattern on the sky. If you really want to get into radio astronomy, uh, this is the stuff that we do. The point of me putting it up here, though, it's not. I'm not trying to scare you with too many extra terms. It really simplifies a fair bit. Um, it's to say that this is super well understood. This is math that we've known about uh, since Maxwell 130 years ago and has been you know, used for radio astronomy for 60 years now. So measuring the, the time lag and making an image out of it is something that's really well understood now. And understood past the level of just these local arrays. If we want to go to super high resolution, we can spread the array out across the entire planet. So you can put a telescope on one side of the planet, another one on the other side of the planet, both look at some distant source, and you can measure how much sooner it arrives in the, this telescope on the left and the telescope on the right, and make an incredibly high resolution image. Uh, there's an array of telescopes spread around the world that does this now. And you may have seen in the news uh, a few months ago, the first ever image of a black hole, that was done using very long baseline interferometry. So essentially this, recording radio signals at different points on the planet, and sticking them together, correlating them, figuring out how long it was between when signals arrived in one and the next, and turning that into an image of the sky. Uh, with an Earth baseline, something like 12,000 kilometers, you can get down to a tenth of a milliarc second, which is something like the resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope. So even though we can't build radio arrays or radio telescopes anywhere near the resolution of Hubble, we can build radio arrays 
easily at that resolution. And we can actually go much farther. Um, past ultra high resolution, you can get to a ridiculously high resolution with ultra long baseline interferometry, which is done with a satellite. There are satellites in Earth Moon orbits so that it goes from the Earth out to the Moon and back to the Earth and out to the Moon with radio detectors on them. And we can combine those with telescopes on Earth and get down to micro arc second. So a uh, hundred times higher resolution than Hubble. And recently it was demonstrated by a colleague of mine uh, at the University of Toronto that you can go past that into what I, I call ludicrously high resolution using interstellar baseline interferometry, where if you look at a distant pulsar, uh, these, these are rapidly rotating neutron stars that we get flashes of radio light from them that are extremely bright. If you actually get multiple images of each because they travel through the interstellar medium, which isn't completely empty, and some of that interstellar medium lenses the light a little bit so that you get images coming to Earth from different directions. And if you can resolve those images, you can use that as a baseline, as a telescope, and you can image the pulsar at something like pico arc second limits, which is a diffraction limit. So pico arc second resolution, something like 100,000 times higher resolution than Hubble, which means you can tell kilometer scale structures at kiloparsecs of distances. So you could see kilometer scale things in the center of the galaxy from here. Uh, ridiculously high resolution is possible with radio astronomy. Uh, that's all well and good, but so far all of the arrays that I've been talking about have been a small number of detectors. Um, and the reason for that is because uh, one, the detectors are expensive, but after you can afford detectors, correlating them, figuring out what this time lag is, is incredibly expensive. Uh, hundreds of trillions of arithmetic operations every second, and it goes as the square of the number of antennas you have. So the VLA has 27 antennas. If they had twice as many, it would cost four times as much computing power. Uh, and they already have an enormous correlator that cost a fortune to build. Um, the ALMA telescope has this correlator that's shown here. This is one quarter of it. Uh, it is a, a tens of millions of dollar instrument just to measure the delay between signals arriving at different telescopes. So building these correlating radio telescopes has been, prohibited, uh, been prohibitively expensive because of the cost of correlating. Building these phased arrays has been prohibitively expensive because of the cost of individual detectors. And so people have actually been doing hybrids. They build these phased arrays. So you build, uh, this is 16 individual detectors in a square. This is what they call a tile. Uh, and then you put a bunch of these tiles out in the desert in Western Australia. Uh, this is the Murchison Widefield Array from Western Australia. And they treat each one of these tiles uh, as, a tele as an individual antenna. You know, they are, each one of these little squares is the equivalent of one of these telescopes. But each one of these squares we use as a phased array. So we, we phased array each square and then we correlate all of them. And that kind of works. Uh, it gets you what you need to do and it gets you sort of halfway between the two worlds. But really we would like to be able to get the best of all worlds, right? That's generally what I'm aiming for. Uh, and thankfully in the last decade, this is what's really been driving this new era that I'm talking about. Uh, consumer technology has come along and knocked down all of these problems uh, with two really, really happy coincidences. One is that everyone wants a cell phone and we want cheap devices with strong signals, which means we need to get amplifiers that are really cheap and have very low noise so that we don't need the cryogenics to actually put each receiver in. And that means instead of these $100,000 devices, uh, tens to hundreds of thousands per receiver, they're now pennies on the dollar. Uh, using technology that's been developed for the cell phone industry, uh, we can build incredibly sensitive, you know, more sensitive than people were able to dream of a couple of decades ago, uh, amplifiers and therefore detectors. So thanks to cell phones, the detector problem is basically gone. The second happy coincidence is that the processing you need to do, this correlation operation, is the same mathematics that you need to project a three-dimensional volume onto a two-dimensional surface. Uh, that may sound slightly esoteric. It's matrix multiplies. 
But it turns out a lot of people are out there, especially this year, trying to project three-dimensional volumes onto two-dimensional surfaces, playing video games. Uh, graphics processing units, video cards, uh, are perfect for doing this radio correlation. So instead of having this massive custom device that Alma built, uh, of which there are four of these stacks of racks, we now use graphics cards uh, taken from your everyday gaming computer. Uh, and they are more powerful than we could ever hope for. Now that almost gets us to this stage where we could completely tile a 100 meter dish and replace one of those scary 100 meter, 300 foot dishes uh, with individual detectors lying out on the ground and just a giant computer behind it, but not quite. Uh, recently, we built some the next best thing. So this is a one-dimensional dish. It's parabolic in one dimension and flat in the other. So that instead of having a focal point that you put detectors at, it's got a focal line that you put detectors at. Each one of the detectors, instead of seeing up down in the sky, it runs from the south horizon to the north horizon directly overhead. And we can take those and we get, instead of a full two-dimensional savings, we get one-dimensional saving. We don't need a full steerable dish. We have a cylinder that sees a band. Uh, and this is something that people had actually explored back in the 60s when they couldn't afford to build telescopes uh, and they couldn't afford the electronics for them because electronics were very rudimentary at the time. Um, but building something like this lets you see a large region of the sky and gets you very close to one of these uh, full dense packed aperture arrays. And this is the approach that we took in Canada when we were looking uh, a few years ago at trying to map out the large scale structure of the universe to measure the properties of dark energy, strange substance that's causing the expansion of the universe to accelerate. So all of that motivation is a, a whole nother talk. But this led us to build, whoops, this guy, Chime. It's just four of these cylindrical uh, dishes with a thousand detectors along the focal line which all go into a correlator that does beamforming and correlation. So it does all of this computing, all in graphics processing units, all in GPUs, uh, and sees the whole sky, or sees this band on the sky all the time. So this was a collaboration of UBC, Toronto, McGill, and the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory. Sorry, that popped under my image. Uh, this is what Chime looks like. It is now built. It's been on the sky operating for uh, a couple of years now. These are enormous. These are aligned north-south. They're 100 meters long and 20 meters wide. So this is effectively the size of the Green Bank Telescope. But it's not just one. Like I said, it can see many, many, many directions at the time. It effectively works as a 1,000 of those dishes looking in different directions. Uh, just running through how this looks, if you stood under one of these cylinders and you look up at it through the mesh that makes up this reflective surface, you see all of these green things. These are the detectors. These are the, those thousand individual radio detectors. Uh, and we, we were able to make those cheaply because amplifiers are cheap on cell phones and they're made out of simple printed circuit boards. Uh, these are things that, again, consumer technology has made mass producible and cheap. So we were able to make a thousand detectors and attach them to these. Uh, I should say, none of this moves. This is all bolted to the ground and stays stock still all the time. That saves you a fortune in, well, maintenance and engineering. Uh, running through the system, uh, so light comes in, hits the reflectors, goes to the feeds, and then goes into a series of analog electronics shown here, which are just quickly that low noise amplifier that I talked about using uh, technology driven by the cell phone industry uh, through heaps and heaps and heaps of cables. Uh, because we have a thousand detectors, we have something like 100 kilometers worth of coaxial cable carrying signals around, uh, which unfortunately when during installation we had to pack into a tiny little car to drive around. Uh, there's a simple filter, which again, dirt cheap, thanks to the investment that the whole world is making into electrical engineering these days. And then digitizers. Um, we built a custom digitizer, which instead of sampling one input at some moderately high price, uh, we've built these custom boards at McGill University, which sample 16 of them. Uh, there are 20 inputs here if you look, but four of them are other things. And then we pack those into these crates 
and we can digitize all thousand detectors uh, at the frequency we at the rates that we need um, for again modest cost compared to any of these other things. And from there, these send data into uh, these graphics processing units that I talked about, uh, which really are just standard computers. So this is Chime builds images of the sky using a thousand Fiji GPUs, which were AMD's best GPUs from three or four years ago, uh, in this cluster of computers, which was built by my grad student, Nolan Denman. He's graduated a couple of years ago now. Uh, this is what the machine looks like. It really is just a PC. Uh, if you've ever opened up your computer, they look a lot like this. Uh, it's got a high-end power supply, pretty typical motherboard and CPU. Uh, these are very high-end GPUs in here. And the whole thing actually we liquid cool because cooling them is a huge pain. Getting GPUs do generate a lot of power. Doing any computation generates a lot of power, a lot of heat. Uh, so the whole thing is liquid cooled. We pump uh, something like 50 gallons a minute into each of two cans containing these to cool them off. Uh, cooling off all that power is actually fairly hard. If you do, any, if anyone in the audience uh, does game uh, and has a nice graphics card, that you've gone to liquid cooling. You may know they attach large heat sinks, big cooling blocks with fans on them. And we do basically the same thing, but at an industrial scale. Uh, this is what our radiator looks like. It is just a bunch of fans across a radiator just to dump all of the heat that those are generating into the ambient atmosphere. Um, so we have to do a couple of funny things, but we steal a lot of technology from a lot of different parts of life. Uh, the output of that, the way the telescope actually sees the sky is this thing, this correlation matrix. And all this is showing is uh, for every one of the 2,000 inputs, because each detector has two polarizations that it's sensitive to, so 1,000 detectors times two, uh, for every one of them, what is the time lag compared to an, uh, every other one? So if you work that out, 2,000 things that you have to calculate the time lag between every pair of them, that gives you just over 2 million correlations that you need to do. And you need to do them 400 million times a second because of the bandwidth that we're sensitive to, which is why we need this massive cluster of GPUs. Uh, it is, as far as I know, the largest farm of GPUs uh, in operation right now. Uh, turned into sort of a normal image. This isn't how people see the sky. This is how radio telescopes see the sky. But if you do a simple transformation on that, you get something like this out the other end. Here it shows that band from the south horizon to the north horizon as time goes by. So this is the sky ro rotating overhead. And here's the galaxy drifting through uh, coming up this side. There are bright radio sources. There's some artifacts because it's not calibrated properly yet. Uh, we're still working on that. You can see supernova remnants, these sort of bubbles, uh, all of these hot regions. There are a million things to see in this map. And this is sort of what fell out quickly from the telescope. The really wondrous thing, though, about CHIME, uh, this Canadian hydrogen intensity mapping experiment, isn't just that it's super sensitive and has this great GPU correlator. Uh, it's that it's a digital telescope. Uh, all of the data has been digitized at this point, just floats around as bits and bytes, which means it's easy to split the data. You can just make a copy of it. Uh, all you do is add a switch, uh, and one copy of the data goes in, two copies come out. And then you can process those data differently for every single thing that you want to do. So now Chime doesn't just make images of the sky for this dark energy project that I mentioned. Uh, there are about 12 different projects always operating on Chime while it just sits there. Uh, it's kind of a miraculous way of a telescope operating. But the major ones are Chime Pulsar, where we look at every known radio pulsar in the northern sky every day. We're building up you know, unprecedented data set there. VLBI to combine with uh, remote stations and get that really high resolution imaging that I talked about. Chime FRB has been the big hit, I think, the breakout project of Chime, uh, which is to search for fast radio bursts, these millisecond long blips of radio light that come from far outside the galaxy that people still are unsure what they're made of uh, or what, what makes them. Uh, and like I said, there are half a dozen other projects on here. And I really do want to emphasize they all run all the time while the telescope just sits there, which means even through COVID and the lockdown, a lot of other telescopes had to stop operating. Chime just kept going. Uh, it's all done digitally. So this telescope stayed online throughout the year and has been producing massive results. Uh, 
last year, I guess, when we first started releasing things, we were quickly on the cover of Nature, uh, showed up in Science Magazine, where they described us as a homespun Canadian telescope, <laughs> which I thought was cute. Wired described Chime as nothing like traditional radio telescopes, which fair enough. The New York Times, again, talking about broadcast mysterious radio signals from deep space. Uh, IFL Science used the same image. Uh, the BBC uses something slightly more creative. CBC used uh, just a different angle. But you know, we were splashed all over the news, and this has happened a few times since, from discoveries of fast radio bursts primarily. So before Chime, there were a couple of dozen that had ever been detected in the history of radio astronomy. And uh, Chime already is well over a thousand of these events. But of course, we're not done there. We, we like our telescope and we're uh, building more um, to try and localize these events, to figure out where fast radio bursts are coming from. Uh, we are building small versions of Chime scattered across North America. We're still finalizing stations. Uh, we are funded for one local and two remote, but there will be small versions of Chime which we will correlate against to where they're coming from with incredibly high angular. Seven, I've got a couple more slides. Uh, the next stage we've already started planning for, uh, here we think we can get up to this full two-dimensional array. A few years have gone by since we proposed Chime. Uh, technology has advanced. Things uh, are moving along. Computers are more powerful and cheaper. So we believe now that we can switch from these one-dimensional cylinders into an array of six meter dishes. So small dishes all packed close together, uh, making this array at the core, which should be something like an order of magnitude more sensitive for, for many science cases than even China. And China is world beating on a bunch of science cases already. So we put in for funding from the government for this and expect to hear back next month. We're pretty excited about that. Uh, Chime was sort of out in front of this whole game. Uh, it got built and the rest of the world hadn't quite caught on to the fact that we had the computing power now and the digitization power to do all this. Uh, this time, the US is trying to come along with projects like the DSA 2000, which is proposing 2000 dishes in a field. And even the, the packed ultra wideband mapping array, Puma, which is a proposed project for late in the next decade, where they want 32,000 dishes, you know, orders of magnitude more than even we're proposing. Uh, and this is really where radio astronomy is going. Now that we can afford to digitize these things and process them and reprocess them, we're suddenly seeing the radio sky in higher resolution, higher definition, uh, broader bandwidth, you know, more spectral resolution. Every aspect is being just turned up to 11 uh, and we're getting an incredible view of the radio sky. So with that, I'll stop uh, and take any questions that there may be. Is anyone steering the questions? <laughs> hmm. Hi, um, I guess maybe to uh, kick it off, I'll have a question from uh, 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 my end. Um, <clears throat> I guess, um, have you been doing research during uh, COVID-19 COVID and um, what is your experience doing research during COVID-19 as opposed to other physicists in the field uh, during the time of restrictions? Yeah, um, so it has slowed down a few things. Uh, like I said, Chime has been carrying on uh, full steam ahead because it needs fairly minimal physical intervention, which means that even though everyone's locked down at their own house, uh, it's not that disastrous. We do need to go out there and service components every now and then, and we have people on site who head in uh, a couple times a week just to you know, kick the tires, uh, reboot switches, uh, repair water leaks and things like that. Um, but for the most part, Chime has carried on gathering the data. Uh, the main impact has been that our research groups, uh, we used to meet regularly face-to-face -face at U of T, right? All of my group, uh, my grad students and postdocs and everyone else would get together daily and talk about all these issues. And now we're on Zoom like everyone else, which is kind of a pain. Uh, it does mean that we're collaborating better with the other institutions. So people at McGill, people at UBC, uh, they seem just as close as someone down the street now. 
because we're all on Zoom. Uh, so the, the data is rolling in as well as ever. The uh, analysis has maybe slowed down a little and people get a little burned out, frankly, after six months of trying to work alone in their living room. Um, development of cord has slowed down a little bit and other telescopes too, just because we don't have access to the labs. So some of the technology development that's been, that we've been working on uh, has been a bit slower. That's interesting, it makes a lot of sense. We have a question from Orin as well. Oh, Donnell, I'll let you uh, take this on. Oh, okay, so Warren is asking that, how do you know the same wavefront to measure the time delay? How do I know the same wavefront to measure time delay? I'm not quite sure I understand what you mean. Uh, so the... when you record a radio wave coming in, uh, is, is the concern that you're seeing different wavefronts or how you compare the, the time of arrival in different telescopes? Okay, you're worried you're seeing different wavefronts. Um, both antennas, so if, if you do, you will see no correlation when you run the correlator. Uh, if you're getting unrelated wavefronts, when you try to, when you run through that math that I splashed up, uh, they will not correlate. You will get zero signal uh, is the short answer. Um, because of the way the math works out, different wavefronts are orthogonal. Uh, you're, you're basically multiplying together two sine waves of different periods uh, and then integrating over them, and those go to zero. Whereas if they are the same wavefront, uh, they will coherently add up uh, and you'll see a signal there. So it's sort of a necessary result. And it's actually a really handy check. Uh, in many cases, it's, it's super useful to be able to see that you are looking at exactly the same wavefront. Um, it's true, so, so part of that relies on the wavefronts being completely random realizations. Uh, it's true that if there were, say, uh, a radio station broadcasting, they could broadcast the same signal at us with slight delays and we would get confused. We would correlate those and we would think that there was one particular delay, uh, which, which was false, which was injected by uh, someone broadcasting it. But nature, thankfully, isn't pathological like that. It doesn't repeat the same signal typically, or if it does, it's because it's been lensed by something. So you're getting multiple copies, like in the case of that pulsar going through the interstellar screen. Uh, I see in the chat, how do you expect snow, sleet, hail, wind, and other weather to affect data collection and longevity of time and incursions of human development? <laughs> the, yeah, the last one's the tricky one. So Chime is built, uh, if you look at this image, you'll notice um, that it's sort of transparent. Uh, the mirror on this is a, a loose mesh. It's sort of like chicken wire. Uh, it's just metal wires run together across the surface. And at radio wavelengths, where the wavelength of light is centimeters to meters, that looks like a perfect mirror. Uh, radio waves then reflect off that perfectly. It's completely, trend, it's completely reflective to, to radio light. But it is not reflective. It's transparent to light and honestly to snow. Uh, snow basically blows through that, and we don't end up with snow buildup on it. Um, the whole thing is engineered to, to withstand, you know, wind and all of those sort of necessary codes. Uh, water can be a concern. We have to water, make everything watertight to make sure that it doesn't get in the way um, because water can corrode electronics and cables and things like that. Uh, human development is the bigger problem that we are looking at this band. And like I said, radio astronomy was developed primarily, well, originally from telecoms and telecoms still want to use all of this bandwidth. Uh, and Chime was built in this 400 to 800 megahertz band. I mean, primarily because that's the, the science we were going after requires that band. Uh, but it was timely because it was built right, well, it was designed shortly after analog television turned off and before digital television turned on, which meant all of the people broadcasting had just turned off all their signals and people hadn't yet turned on digital TV. Nowadays, as digital TV stations are coming on, we lose chunks of the band periodically. So we go blind to particular colors. Uh, when people go by with cell phones, uh, we see that as radio frequency interference. It, it degrades our sensitivity. It knocks out moments of the day. Uh, so having people around is definitely bad. Thankfully, we're at the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory in British Columbia. It's a radio uh, protected area. So people are not allowed to build radio transmitters and we are surrounded by a low a uh, series of hills and mountains that block most transmitters. So 
we are insulated a little bit against human development, but uh, not perfectly. And that's that's the reason why you know people go to say Western Australia to build BMWA because there are no people there and there aren't going to be people there. Do we use distributed computing to defray costs? Uh, unfortunately, distributed computing doesn't work super well. Uh, the problem is that the data coming from the digitizer is enormous. It's about a terabyte per second. Uh, and we can't afford that kind of uplink to Amazon Cloud Services uh, or anywhere else. Uh, shipping that amount of data offsite isn't practical. So this whole GPU correlator is immediately next to the telescope. Uh, and it all lives right there. Um, we do distribute computing across the GPUs, but we are unable to say send it off to cloud computing services or anything like that, just because the volume is too high. This chime of a connection with the SKA in South Africa. So SKA is sort of a next generation telescope that's been proposed for a while. It follows a little bit on uh, the model of MWA and a little bit on the model of the VLA. So it's got two components, which is like a larger version of this, and a little which is sort of like a larger version of this. Um, Chime is officially a pathfinder project for the square kilometer array. Uh, and that's, that's the extent of our, our collaboration. Uh, some of the members of Chime work with it. We are trying to we were used as sort of a technology development bed for SKA, but we aren't directly related uh, beyond being a pathfinder. Um, we are built, many of the people on Chime are building a telescope in South Africa called HIRAX, the Hydrogen Intensity and Real-Time Analysis Experiment, uh, which is similar to CORD. Uh, it's a large number of small dishes, and it's also meant to be a, a precursor to SKA, but a more direct precursor. Um, so do anyone have an, any other questions? Um, All right, well, thanks very much for having me. I'll put up your slides. <laughs> yeah, so guys, we have um, Space Trivia coming this November 18th. So make sure you join us there because we have prizes and at the end of the whole trivia league. So make sure you just join us. Um, professor, if you can go on to the next one. Um, and also we have, uh, we will be streaming um, SpaceX Crew One launch um, with, um, uh, so we have a launch party, so uh, like viewing party. So you can join us for that also. So the date will depend on what the date the launch is. So stay tuned for the further details. And make sure you follow us on the social medias. All the links are here and then like the names are here. So make sure you do that. And that's it. Thank you, Professor, for giving us this amazing talk. And we hope we can hear you in further events. And thank you for giving us your time. Thanks very much for having me. It was always good to tell people about this stuff. Thank you so much.